palsy is it's that word that gets thrown around. Everyone's heard it, but not everybody understands it. And so if you've met one person in your life with cerebral palsy, that's what you you take back to. So you always think, oh yeah, I understand cerebral palsy because I met Ashley 10 years ago. I know cerebral palsy. But then you meet Zoe and boom, your, your mind's been blown. Movement and posture. It is a um, cerebral meaning the brain. Palsy, lack of muscle control. That's a permanent but not unchanging condition. Now it's important to remember that the brain injury itself doesn't change. That is very stable, it's very constant. Um, it happens once as an injury and then the effect it has on the body as a human grows is what starts to change. A baby being born has the same brain injury and the same effect on their body as a 60 year old with that same injury as they age. But with a tightened muscle over time, that's obviously going to have, have an effect on their movement, their posture, might cause a shortened bone, a shortened limb. It might mean that their walk is a little bit different to um, what it would be otherwise. And so what we see change as people get older is based on the effect of ageing. So CP does affect people in different ways. Um, there's a number of people in the audience and the panel tonight that have cerebral palsy and you can see that no one person is the same. So remember that it is always um, very different in the way it affects movement, uh, balance, posture, um, mobility. And it can range from a very mild impairment to quite a profound impairment. I was saying before, Matt cut my grass because I was going to tell you that every 15 hours somebody is born with cerebral palsy. <laughs> and I was going to tell you that in Australia, 17 million people are living with cerebral palsy. The incidence in developing countries is much higher than the incidence in um, developed countries. Some of the questions you might have is, well, what causes cerebral palsy? There's actually no known cause. It's from a number of causal pathways. And premature birth usually is caused by a number of factors that might have actually caused the damage in the first place. So anything up to the age of two years old, damage to the brain within that time, is going to be called cerebral palsy. So I've just mentioned a stroke. But if it was a stroke in an adult, it gets called a stroke. If it's a stroke in an infant, it gets called cerebral palsy. Because again, it goes back to the effect that the brain damage has on the body as the person develops. Another big thing to think about, cerebral palsy is the physical condition that is caused by the damage to the brain. Cerebral palsy is not the intellectual condition, it's not the visual impairment, it's not the hearing impairment, it's the physical condition. Remember I talked about the umbrella term of um, the movement disorder. What we know is that 48% of people with cerebral palsy have an intellectual disability. But out of those 48%, it's a big bandwidth. A lot of that can still be quite mild. But scientifically and medically, we would talk about the type of movement caused by the damage to the brain the body part affected, and then the level of severity. The motor types of determining the different movement disorders that may present based on the area of damage in the brain. The most common form of cerebral palsy is spastic cerebral palsy. So this is where you all may have heard of that organisation used to be called the spastic centre, because medically, doctors thought everyone had spasticity, but it's not the case. So roughly 80% of people with cerebral palsy have spasticity and it can be a mixed presentation as well. Spasticity is definitely the most mm. common type. Then you've got um, dyskinetic CP which is due to damage in the deep parts of the brain. They're about coordination, it's about um, the fine motor control, that kind of stuff. And ataxic CP is damage to the cerebellum which um, is about um, smooth movement, coordination, all that kind of stuff. And again I mentioned brain injuries earlier on as in a stroke. If somebody had any kind of brain injury as an adult, the damage to the brain would present exactly the same. Just again, it doesn't have that lifelong effect on the body as it does when it happened as an, as an infant. The body part affected, you're looking at um, quadriplegic presentation. So that's a term that most people know of, quadriplegic quad, happens in spinal cord injuries as well. Diaplegic, not as commonly heard of. So diaplegic is when it's just the lower limbs affected, but there might be some sort of upper limb involvement as well. But usually someone with diaplegia, um, they either walk maybe with um, crutches or um, some sort of walking aid, or they might use a manual wheelchair, and they look you know, big and strong and, and able-bodied up in their, in their upper body. Hemiplegic, that's another term you may have heard of. So it's when it's just one side of the body affected, 
and it's the opposite side of the brain that's been damaged. Generally when we talk about these types of presentations, it's when the person has their motor cortex damaged. So in looking at the picture, it's that outer unit of the brain that's really affecting the muscle movement. Now this is the severity level. This is a universal tool and you may hear it get thrown around. Um, not everybody with cerebral palsy understands this, um, this language of the gross motor function classification system but it's something that I believe people with CP should understand and I do everything I can to try and teach them that. Because it is a universal tool that helps us understand mobility. It's pure and simple mobility, how people get around in our world. It ranges from GMFCS 1 to 5. Please excuse me for using the picture of the children. However, that's the only one I can find on the internet that's colourful. But GMFCS1 are the people that say, oh, I've just got CP in my car. They can run, they can carry things while they run, they can run upstairs without holding onto the rail. GMFCS1, you know, you're kind of looking at very mild presentation, participate in community and in life without any real need of support. GMFCS, I'm going to skip two. GMFCS3, you're looking at someone who uses maybe a K-walker, um, maybe two walking sticks, um, but potentially they use a, a wheelchair for long distances, especially in adulthood, a wheelchair for long distances, it's very functional. Okay? We're not saying the person can't walk, we're saying the person can get to where they want to go to. So it's very functional to use a wheelchair, GMFCS3, middle of the ground. I'm going to skip forward, I'm going to go straight to GMFCS5, top of the level. Somebody who needs support for mobility in all type of movement. They are unable to independently move themselves from A to B. Now, technology allows us to get somebody to go from GMFCS5 to a GMFCS4 because of the likes of powered wheelchairs. So I know a number of um, people who use a head system on their wheelchair to be able to drive around. Um, maybe a, a joystick on their foot plate so that they can drive around. So due to technology, they go from needing full support for mobility to being able to drive themselves in a power wheelchair. So, so thinking about prognosis, you're looking at how many people um, you know, function in a wheelchair. So 23% with quadriplegia, 39 hemiplegia, 38 diplegia. Here are the associated conditions. Really important to understand the other stuff that people with CP are affected by. It's not a blanket rule that everyone with CP has a hearing impairment, but there is um, a lot of incidence of it. A person with cerebral palsy may be non-verbal. They may not use verbal communication, but they certainly have communication methods. So never assume that somebody can't talk. One in two people with CP have pain, chronic pain that they're living, and um, that's probably still unreported. And it may be due to the fact that people with CP frequently have surgery, especially in a younger age. It might be that they have uh, a deformity of a limb that is painful. It might be that the tension of the muscle from that spasticity is so tight that it actually causes them that chronic pain day in, day out, which you can think of would have an effect on sleep. It would have an effect on your mood, all that kind of stuff. And along with me, but with everybody else here with CP, we can hopefully help you understand what that is and, and all that kind of stuff. So, okay, thanks for listening.